Please stand for the reading of God's word. I do ask that you forgive me for taking my seat today. Uh, if you don't know, I dropped the table on my foot last Sunday at the church and a brother pastor was hurting real bad. Uh, my foot swelled, it swole up. I don't know how you say it properly, but it was swelling. And uh, it, was, it was pretty bad. Uh, but I am thankful for those who were aware that they prayed for me. I'm also thankful my wife, she took care of me and she rubbed some anointing oil on it and she, she took care of me and she blessed me today or last week and all week rather. And so I'm so thankful just to be here. Uh, I still can't wear my right shoe. Uh, so I, sometimes I go out with mixed matching shoes or I go, go around the store with the limp. Um, but I'm not ashamed of my little limp because it happened in church. But forgive me for sitting, but if you're standing, we do this uh, because we honor the Lord our God and we honor everything that God has done for us. We're gonna be coming out of uh, Psalms chapter 19 today. I am gonna ask <clears throat> for those of you that have your Bible, digital and physical, to grab them today because today is gonna to be one of those days where I am gonna be going scripture heavy and I'm gonna be referencing uh, scripture quite a bit. So I'm asking <clears throat> that you grab your Bible today because I'm going scripture heavy, uh, as always, I have logged the scriptures, at least the main scriptures, in on the church's website. If you're on our website, you can go to livingfaithct.org forward slash sermons. Again, livingfaithct forward slash sermons. And if you click on uh, scriptures for the day or something like that, it'll take you to this, uh, this document with the scriptures. And uh, I'm going to be going scripture heavy today. And we're going to be talking about miracle number two, changing outcomes because of my meditation. The title of today's message is miracle number two, changing outcomes because of my meditations. Because we're going to be talking about meditations and because we're integrating this into miracles, today the reason why we're going to be scripture heavy uh, is because you're going to be repeating yourself and you're repeating to yourself and reciting to yourself the word of God. And I'm going to challenge every one of you who are, uh, thank you, honey, for putting the link in there in the comments. I'm challenging every one of you who is watching on the stream uh, to, to capture the scriptures. Everyone that's home, write them down, open up your Bible. If you're at work, please, you know, do the best you can. I know you're working, but you may have to replay this. Uh, and those in the room, you guys have your Bibles in some, some form with you. There's nothing better than a recitation of God's word. I can preach the paint off the walls and I can preach you happy and I can give you inspirational words, but there's nothing like your own ability to consume and digest the word of God. And so today we're going to be coming out of Psalms 19, chapter, chapter 19, verse 4. Here is the word of the Lord for today. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock, King James Version says, my strength and my redeemer. You may have your seats in the presence of God. I grew up uh, in a Pentecostal holiness church. And for every, uh, after every church service before church ended, this was the benediction. And uh, I remember when I first became a reverend and I had the privilege of uh, reciting the benediction and it says, let the words of my mouth and we will repeat this word for word, especially in youth church when my dad was a youth pastor. And uh, we repeat it, hands raised, right hand raised, the words of my mouth, let the words of my mouth uh, and the meditation of my heart, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, be acceptable in thy sight. Oh Lord, oh Lord, my strength, my strength and my redeemer. For those listening and watching, that was not an echo. That was me kind of imitating what church was like when I was a kid. And that was the, the doxology. It was a staple. As a kid, I didn't really digest that in a personal way. But as I become a man, a man with a family, a man with a career and responsibilities, these words ring ever so true. When David writes, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, my strength, my rock, my redeemer. Here's the truth about all this. On a daily basis, we are preoccupied with life and we find ourselves busy figuring out how to manage life. 
And as I'm teaching today, I'm going to challenge you to listen and digest. I want to challenge you to meditate, and I'm going to share and explain all this. But we're finding ourselves balancing life. We're finding ourselves balancing marriage if you're married. You find yourself balancing relationships with your children. You find yourself balancing work and family and everything else that's going on in life. You're trying to balance it all. Pre-corona, this was true. It's true during corona, and it's going to be true after corona. It's going to be true five years from now, 10 years from now, 12 years from now, 15, 20, 30 years from now. You are constantly battling life, balancing life rather, and trying to figure out which portions of your life receives which portions of energy you have available, particularly on a day-to-day -day basis. And while we're trying to figure out life, we try to figure out what is the best balance. You know, it's easy to criticize people when you're not the one on the court or you're not the one in the starting lineup or you're not the one in the game. See, if I was him, if I was her, I would do this. One of the best positions to have is a Monday night quarterback position. Pastor Bruce playing football, you know, maybe it's just Monday quarterback role. I think that's what they call it, right? And it's the best position because you get to play quarterback after the fact. A after the game is over, come on, give me some amens in the chat uh, below. After the clock hits zero, after the interception is thrown, I'm looking at the chats, come on, give me an amen in the chats. A after you lost the game, it's, it's awesome to be a, a Monday quarterback. The next best position is to be the couch quarterback. Oh, why did he throw it like that? Did he see number 88 open? Did he see 92 coming down the lane and getting ready to jump the passing lane? Didn't he see the rush and the blitz? Didn't he, didn't he, didn't he? And it's so easy to play Monday quarterback or the arm quarterback, and especially in real life, where we look at other people's lives and we say, why do they do that? See, if I was them, I would do something totally different. But here's the reality. We are constantly trying to find the right balance between managing the moment versus forecasting the future versus appreciating the past. This is a 3D management system we're dealing with, past, present, future. You don't want to forget what happened because we learn from what happened. We've been learning in this church that God gives us the bread of affliction and water of adversity as a history lesson to project what's going to happen forward. So we can't forget the past. Jesus said whatever was written aforetime was written for us to learn from. And we can't not be in the moment because the moment is real. Once the moment passes, it becomes history. So you can't forget the moment. And if you're like me, I'm always thinking about tomorrow. I'm always thinking about next week, next month, next year, next quarter, next, the next decade. And sometimes I'm so far down the line, I forget the moment. The hard part is we all have a preference. You online, you listen to me on the phone. You have a preference. Some of us love to live in the past. We can't forget what happened. Don't you remember what they said to you, what they did to me, and what they, and remember that fun moment that we had with the fact, you can't live out, you can't get out of the past. Some of us are so in the moment, we forget what happened, we don't care about tomorrow. And some of you are like me, where you just all about tomorrow, and you forget about the moment. It is a balance in that. Some of you are struggling, should I save for tomorrow, should I spend this money? <laughs> should I discipline my kids now, or should I just let them be kids? Do I share my frustration with my wife or my husband or do I just protect their feelings and just move on? Should I search for a new job or should I stay where I'm at? Does any of this sound familiar? And if it does, Stephanie, thank you for texting an amen. If it does, just text me an amen. Just chat an amen. I heard some amens in the room. This is the day-to-day -day balance we deal with, we struggle with today versus tomorrow versus yesterday. It's challenging. And every now and again, we must stop what we're doing to reset ourselves and to focus on the main thing. 
The main thing is Jesus. The main thing is our creator, God. I got some amens. Thank you, Lord. For, for the main thing, it's the word of God. The main thing is what's in front of us. The main thing is what he did for us on a cross. The main thing is heaven coming in the future. We got to keep focus on the main thing. And in your real life, you're going to have to identify what the main thing is for yourself. And as a result, you're going to have to put everything and everyone else in a proper category if it's not the main thing. In order to focus on the main thing, you, my friends, if you're listening on Zoom, if you're watching, if you're in the room, you're going to have to center yourself. And I want you to hear me good. You must center yourself and you must focus. The centering process that we have as believers includes one main ingredient that many of us overlook on a regular basis. And that main ingredient for centering oneself is called honoring the Sabbath. The Sabbath means to be absent from work. It means a day of atonement. This is the day that we, we, were, we ask God to forgive us for our sins. The Sabbath was instituted by God. And we saw the first example of this when God created the heavens and the earth and he rested on that last day. This was reaffirmed by Jesus throughout the Gospels when Jesus reiterated that I am the Lord of the Sabbath. But the reality that we all deal with is that we've lost touch with the intention and the purpose of the Sabbath and as a result of that, many of us have lost touch with establishing boundaries in our lives. We have lost touch with establishing boundaries with relationships. We've lost touch with establishing boundaries with our family, with our friends, with our careers. We've lost touch with what it means to have boundaries set so that I can focus on the main thing and to recenter myself to become and be what God has called me to be. That we want to achieve this year alone. Some of us are moving closer and closer to achieving those goals and some of us are still a ways away. And you gotta ask yourself, have I been focused? Have I truly centered myself so that I can meet my personal goals, my professional goals, my relationship goals, my family goals, my, my financial goals? Have you centered yourself and have you taken on the concept of the Sabbath? Resting, recalibration, refocusing, re-energizing, centering. It's the concept. They tried to criticize Jesus and his disciples for eating on the Sabbath. And by that criticism, they missed the whole point. It's not about work. It's about the concept of focus, of dedication to God and dedication to yourself. It's hard to do that for some of us because we're moving way too fast. We're rushing through life. We're trying to get to our goals tomorrow. December 31st, I believe, we had a vision board party here. And we welcomed in January 1st together as a church family. Many of us who were here, we set goals that we wanted to achieve this year and some of us for the next 10 years. The human flaw that we possess is we write these goals down knowing it's not going to happen tomorrow, but we feel like it ought to happen tomorrow. You know, I want to launch this business. I'm going to go to the bank tomorrow. They're going to give me the loan. I'm going to sign the lease. I'm going to open up this credit line, and I'm going to buy the product. 
I'm gonna open up my shingle and say we're open and customers are gonna flood in. Just like that. I'm gonna start a ministry, start a church. I'm gonna become a pastor and my church is gonna grow and mushroom and people are gonna flood in. Just like that. I'm gonna start a family. I'm gonna get married to a beautiful person I'm going to have beautiful children who are just going to love and adore me. And we're going to live the American dream in a mega mansion that's modest. And drive an expensive car that's modest. And everyone is still going to love me. And life is going to be on the bed of roses. Just like that. This is how we think. We vision and we plan. And we start moving towards these things because this is what we expect. But if you want the miracles of God to come into your life, there has to be an acknowledgement that it's not going to happen like that. The Bible says that you have all these plans, but the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. How you may get there may not be how you think. And what you think you want, God may not have in store for you. Slow down. This Sunday service is about us slowing down we want miracles acts of god to take place in our life we want god to speak to us we want god to reveal his will to us we want his purposes fulfilled in our lives in order to do that we must slow down the miracle that we're talking about is seeing my dreams unfold because of meditation Meditation is defined as the process of thinking deeply about a subject. For those of you who are writing notes at home, meditation means to think deeply about a subject. It means to have resounding music or to muse. Hear me now. In the Hebrew, meditation means to think deeply and to have resounding music. Resounding music is a loud sound that fills a room and it's so loud that it echoes. It echoes throughout the entire space that it occupies. And to muse means to reflect or to think about what is or what was. When you put it all together, meditation means to reflect on the echoing sounds of your thoughts you have filled your inward parts with. Meditation is an internal process. It has absolutely nothing to do with any external forces or people. It is intended to be internalistic. It is about one's self, one's ability to have a reflection of echoing sounds of thoughts in your inward parts from the top of your head to the sole of your feet there should be an echoing sound that fills your body we are constantly in meditation and in meditative states and how i know this is because whatever we think paul says we execute in our body be transformed by the renewing of your mind romans chapter 2 so that whatever you think you execute so you can prove the perfect and acceptable will of god your mind dictates behavior romans 12 1 and 2. whatever you think it becomes a part of who you are and it is fulfilled throughout the body. You think negativity, your body receives that 
and that echoing sound becomes a part of what your body projects out. Think about every time you've been stressed out in your mind. It travels to every nerve of your body. Limbs begin to hurt. Organs begin to hurt. Your breathing becomes difficult. Your body begins to reflect what your mind has determined and has decided. But the moment happy thoughts kind of jump in there, the body feels light. The body distresses. Two to three years ago, many of you may not have met me this way, but I was bald. And it was because I was dealing with a lot of stress. Now, and I've always told people this, I'm thankful that I became bald because the alternative would have been a heart attack or an aneurysm or a stroke or some sort of other issue that I can't call. People's bodies respond differently, but I became bald and I lost all my hair. And I remember way before I started losing hair, I remember the moments that led up to that actual physical manifestation of hair loss, family stresses, financial stresses, work stresses, professional stresses, personal stresses. I made a decision one day to leave my job because that was the biggest source of stress, the biggest occupier of stress. The resounding sound in my body was this was not a place for me. The resounding sound that I was meditating on was I'm not good enough. Am I being racially profiled on a daily basis? Are these people challenging my intellect and my ability to do my job? The resounding music I heard was, I'm not appreciated. They don't know what they have. I'm doing everything. Does this sound familiar to everybody in the room on the Zoom call? Does this sound familiar? Text me back. Tell me in the chat that this sound familiar. Have you ever felt those feelings, that lack of appreciation, not to mention had a pregnant wife at home who had a successful pregnancy with that third child up and until September, August and September. She couldn't go to a family function with me in Atlanta because her pressure was just starting to act up. Came back, I went by myself, came back. Her pressure got worse, went to a hospital. And I already had PTSD about hospitals because she lost a cousin early in our marriage, going to the wrong hospital. And of course, I'm struggling because as a husband and very protective of my wife, I, y'all no, y'all not killing my wife. Somebody gonna die, but it ain't gonna be my wife. Dealing with two children by myself, no family, no friends in Connecticut. And then, 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 all the while dealing with work stress, get a call, my wife is in the hospital and they say they have to perform emergency C-section. Now I'm 40 minutes away in Windsor. She's all the way in Avon, Farmington. I got to get two kids ready, plus myself, jump out the house, drive over there in speed. By the time I get there, she's in surgery. Can't go in a surgical room because got two kids, no family, can't leave my kids, and they were small at the time. And she gives birth to our baby Emma. Three week, three months, rather, ahead of schedule. And she was tiny. She was smaller than the, the palm of my hand. Dealing with that, dealing with a wife who still had hypertension issues even after giving birth, dealing with a premature child who was barely big enough to breathe on her own, other babies in the room who died who were premature, but my baby was struggling to survive, got two other children dependent upon me, got a job, and I called my job and I told them, please don't mess up anything. I'll be back in a couple of days. Don't, don't break anything. I'm stressing about work. Family, kids, money, everything else. No family, no friends. My parents are coming, but they're four hours away. Her mom is coming, but she's four hours away. We didn't have close relationships at the time. Couldn't call nobody. The church we were leading were a bunch of seniors and young people, and they can't really help. Stress. Four months later, my wife uh, comes up to me and says, um, you got a ball spot in the back of your head, bro. And it was like a little dot. And I'm like, what you talking about? So I cut my hair down. I was like, oh, I mean, probably, probably nick myself. A couple of weeks later, she said, mm, that thing getting bigger. <laughs> and then it kept getting bigger. And then it started growing to other spots in my head. 
And then I had to deal with the reality that I lost my hair. By the time I lost my hair, I already switched jobs. Emma came home. She was a plump little baby. Everything was settling down, but the damage was done. Sometimes your body doesn't show the effects of what you've been dealing with in your mind and in your spirit until weeks or months later. It is a resounding sound. It echoes, it reverberates throughout the body. And while I was in a much better place, much better job, my wife and I, we were figuring things out, things were getting better. It still, I didn't expect my hair to grow back. I, I was expecting to be bald for the rest of my life and I made it my new normal. 18 months later, my hair started sprouting again and it was weird. It took 18 months for it to come back. 18 months for stress to fully leave my body. 18 months of consistency of trying to be happy, think positive thoughts, experience positive things, remove negative antibodies from my life. 18 months for the resounding echo to be replaced with a brand new one. We're constantly meditating. What do you meditate upon? What's echoing through your mind over the past week, over the past month, over the past six months? What's been echoing, bouncing off the wall chambers of your heart and inside the walls of your mind? What's been going back and forth? Can't get it out of your mind, can't unthink it, can't unsee it, can't unfeel it. What's been bouncing back and forth? Don't give me something like the goodness of the Lord. Lies. We all know that God is good, but life happens that makes you question how good God is. We are constantly meditating on money. Don't got enough money to pay the bills. My credit is jacked up. Want a bigger house, need a bigger house. My cars is jacked up. Got an accident. My brakes are shot, need gas. Meditating on relationships. Does she love me? Does he love me? Am I going to get married? Are we going to stay married? Friendships. Why don't they call me? I'm always the one reaching out. I'm always doing something for somebody. Nobody checks on me. Nobody sends me Instagram or DMs or Facebook DMs. Nobody texts my phone. We're meditating on love. I love my parents, but it was always weird. I love my, my cousins but they were always jealous of me. I love my job, but they don't show no love back. We're meditating on careers, right? Can I get a promotion? How come that dum-dum is, is promoted and I'm not? Don't they know he's still in time? Don't they know he's cheating the system and he's growing and I'm not? Do I get another job? Do I need to take a job closer to my house? How do I get to work? Just constantly going back and forth. My health. I need to change my diet, but I'm so lazy. I need to stop eating Lisa's treats, but it just, I just can't help myself. You like how I did that, right? <laughs> but, but I'm constantly stressing out. What are you meditating on? What's resounding in your mind and in your spirit? It's a spin cycle and it's hard to stop it. What we are meditating on is an experience of the moment. It's a reflection of what we're going through. And it's a reflection of the past. And it's also a projection of what we hope to get out of or deal with in the future. It's a nonstop process. A lot of what we do and what creates this spin cycle comes from what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 5 and 3. For a dream comes with much business. We dream the dreams we have, we, we daydream, we, we think about the things we think about constantly because we're constantly doing some sort of exchange, transaction. Once a thing happens to us, we have constant transactions with ourselves. You know how wrong you were for that, right? This is you talking to yourself. You know how you should have never done that, right? You should have never said that, should have never done that, should have never been here. Always having a transaction of guilt for peace. You trade away your opportunity for, to be at peace because you just want to feel the guilt. 
You trade away an opportunity for love because you don't deserve love because of what happened 5, 10, 15 years ago. You trade away the ability to be at a place of calmness because you feel like you don't deserve. Constant transactions with yourself and telling yourself you don't deserve it, you ain't good enough. Let me reject this now. You are more than good enough. By his stripes, you have been made whole and you are healed, not just for the cancer. You're not just healed from the diabetes. You're healed in your mind and in your soul. This is a meditation service today. Would you tell yourself you are healed? You can hear me repeat it. You can hear me preach it. You can hear me teach it. Would you recite to yourself, self, insert your name? You are healed. Self, insert your name. I am forgiven. Self, insert your name. I have been redeemed. Self, insert your name. I have been sanctified. Self, insert your name, I have been restored. No preacher can recite this for you 24 hours a day. No pastor can text you a reminder every day. This is stuff you gotta do for yourself and work out your own salvation. I am, because my daddy is, I am. I can, because my daddy did. I will, because my father always has. Y'all getting this? Yes. Are y'all on Zoom getting this? Are y'all slowing down? Text me. Let me know what's going on in the chats. Are y'all getting this? This is personal. Sometimes, as you begin to reset and recenter yourself, you are going to have to, and hear me good, you are going to have to limit, if not, how do I say this? Cut out, eliminate, reduce, fire, outside interferences from family and friends because some of them are just flat negative. Now, don't get it twisted. Sometimes your family tells you the truth and we don't want to hear it. Then there are those family members that are straight up negative. Here's one of the scriptures. I didn't put this online, but if you got your Bible, open up to Job chapter 4, verse 3 through 6. Listen to the dichotomy of a friend talking to someone who's down and out. Listen to how someone who says he loves his friend speaks to his friend. Behold, you, Job, have instructed many. And you, Job, have strengthened the weak hands. Your words have upheld him who was stumbling, and you have made firm the feeble knees. But... After everything good you've done all through your life, but, but now it has come to you and you are impatient. Uh, are you, you judging me right now? I just lost my wife, my kids, my staff, my business, my house. I got skin boils. I'm near death and I don't know what's going on. Are you calling me impatient? All the years I, I spent serving God, I'm not allowed to say, God, what the heck is going on? Y'all ain't saying, come on, y'all, don't leave me by myself. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm struggling to understand why me? Yes, why do I got cancer? Why is my marriage on the rocks? And I mean legit on the rocks. Why are my kids the ones that are crazy? Why is my job upside down? Why are my finances left and right? And you telling me I'm impatient? After all the fasting I've done for you and my kids and my wife and for my... You telling me I'm impatient? And his friend says, it touches you and you are dismayed. You ever had somebody try to play you because they know you're a believer and they say, don't you believe in God? Where's your faith now, Bruce? I thought you believed in God, Lisa. 
All right, I thought you said Christianity was the best thing that ever happened to you. Now you're dismayed. This is what he's saying to his own friend. It's not your fear of God, your confidence. He's being antagonistic right now. Now, I don't know about you. If this was my friend, I probably would have punched him in the throat by now. Because now you're antagonizing my relationship with God. It's not your fear of God, your, your confidence, and the integrity of your ways, your hope. If you have been struggling to move on from family and friends, let this meditative service be the day that you decide in your mind, I love you, but it's over. I'm going to let that sit right there. We grew up together. I will never forget how you gave me that $5 when I needed gas in my tank. But dude, it's over. I mean, I'll show up at the next family barbecue whenever it's safe, you know, when Corona is like out of the, the picture. I'll eat your ribs because they're really good. And I will still say hi to you. But the days of us like being close like that, the days of me sharing my heart, the days of me calling you when I'm at my worst moment, mm, over, done, no more. Some of you listening to me, watching me, hearing me, y'all need to make a decision today that it is over. Meditation is an opportunity for you to tap into God and a tap into the God that we serve, and a tap into his spirit. In order to tap into God through meditation, you must study the nature of God. You must know who he is. In order to know who God is, you must read his word. God is not a feeling. God is not an emotion. God is not your energy being up or down. God is. He is a written word. He is a force. God is all around us. If you want to understand how God is working, read his word. And when you read his word, open your eyes. And you notice that God is in everything. He's in all and through all. Some in the secular realm call him an energy and a force. God is. I am that I am. I am God in the wind. I am God in the rain. I am God in the sunshine. I am God in the ash. I am God in the depths of the ocean. I am God in the birds. I am God in the creatures under the sea. I am God in you. And I am God of all things known to mankind and then some. In order to meditate and tap it into God, you got to study him. Number two, to effectively meditate, you must become a disciple of his son, Jesus. Jesus equals salvation, point blank period. Jesus also means and equals teaching and instruction. Jesus also means redemption and forgiveness. When people will never forgive you, you will always find forgiveness in Jesus. The blood of Jesus is your get out of jail free card. Not to be abused, but really, it helps. It restores. It redeems. It sets free. It rejuvenates. It brings you closer to a source that can sustain. And lastly, in order to tap into God and his spirit through meditation, you must learn how to count and calculate. Y'all weren't expecting that, were you? <laughs> you gotta learn how to do math. Now y'all can, can be honest, I'm reading the chats. Y'all, my wife said in the throat, my Lord. Listen, you gotta learn how to count. You gotta learn how to do math. Why are you saying that, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, the last clause of that verse, verse says, think about these things. And the word think in this particular text, as Paul writes it, actually translate to count and calculate. When you're doing math, the goal is to add and multiply. 
because you want to see bigger numbers. And if you're saying you don't, you're lying. Tell me you don't want to see bigger numbers in your bank account. Tell me you don't want to see a positive improvement in your health. Tell me you don't want to see a positive improvement, a multiplier improvement in your marriage, in your friendships. Tell me you don't want to see your kids add and multiply to your legacy. Who in their right mind wants everything in their life to be subtraction and division? There is no peace with subtraction and division. The more I'm divided, the less of me I am. The more you subtract from me, the less I am being. So Paul writes, learn how to count. Whatever things are true, whatever things are honorable, whatever is just and whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, count Add, calculate these things in your life. Philippians 4, 8. You must think positively. You want to effectively meditate? You want to see miracles happen in your life? You want to tap into God? Meditate. And you got to change what you meditate on. Our text for the day gives us the formula for meditation. I hope you're staying with me because I'm trying to help somebody today. Our text in Psalms 19, 14 says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight to the Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's break down the formula. Words of my mouth means the utterance, the things I speak, the words that I say, the promises that I articulate, and the commandments that I give. This means that whatever comes out of my mouth, I must guard my mouth and my tongue. I must be careful what I say, what I speak, what I utter, what I promise, what I command. I must be careful, get this, what I say to myself. Because the words that I speak to myself causes meditation to occur. This is what the Bible says about the mouth and the tongue, James 3, 6. And I'm going to repeat this again, James 3, chapter 6. And the tongue is a fire. A world of unrighteousness. How many times have you been arguing with someone you love and you said something that set a fire in a relationship? Y'all got mad and walked out on each other because whatever you said, whatever they said, caused y'all to say, you know what? If I don't walk away right now, a bomb is about to go off. James 3 and 6 says the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members as one of us. It is not an external force. A tongue is not a weapon we pick up. A tongue is a weapon that we possess. And it says it is staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and setting on fire and set on fire by hell. The weapon, the most, the most dangerous weapon we have is a member of our own body. You have the power to hurt and harm people. People. The biggest lie we were ever told as children was, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Lies. Lies. Let your wife or your husband say something to you that only they know about you and let me know how you feel then. Let your kids say something to you that they observed about you and let me know how you feel then. Let your friends say something snarky or smart about you and to you, let me know how you feel. Let your boss say something crazy to you, you let me know how you feel. It is a lie. Six and stones 
they do break bones, but words hurt like none other. And for many years, many of you have been hurting yourself because of what you've been speaking to yourself. Proverbs 18 and 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruits. The formula again is Psalms 1914. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. Meditation means resounding music. To muse within. To meditate means to have an echo going through the chambers of my heart and my mind and my soul. This means you must protect what you allow inside of your mind, heart, and soul. You must be careful what you speak to yourself. Somebody text me amen because I know I'm telling the truth. You must be careful what you articulate to yourself. While it may seem innocent to say I suck or I'm not good enough or I stink, you don't know how that could become an echo chamber in your heart triggering memories of your past. You've been through something in your past and one negative word spoken by you can bring all that up and cause you to become paralyzed by constant analysis of what mama said to me when I was five, what daddy said to me when I was eight, what auntie so-and-so said to me when I was 10, what Mrs. So-and-so said to me when I was in sixth grade. You must guard, and I mean guard, what you allow in your body. We talked about fasting last week. We talked about diet change. Yeah, guard what you put in your body food-wise, but you gotta guard what you put in your soul. Jesus says, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles you, but it's what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. What comes out of the heart, it comes out of the mouth. Scripture says, the heart is desperately wicked. Who knows what's in the heart? Only God knows, but the problem is, Pastor Bruce, we can't keep our mouth shut, i.e. James chapter 3, verse 6. We can't help but tell you how I feel about you. I can't help but tell you how much I don't like you. I can't help but tell myself I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, I'm too ugly, I'm too light-skinned, I'm too black, I'm too white, I'm too this, I'm too that. You can't help it. So whatever is desperately wicked inside the heart eventually comes out of your mouth and it echoes in the heart and mind of you. Lastly, this formula, 19, Psalms 1914, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, last phrase, be acceptable in your sight. This means pleasurable. May it be delightful. May my words and my heart meditations bring favor to you god may what i say and think bring goodwill and be acceptable to you but get this when david said may it be acceptable in your sight what david was saying may it be acceptable to the front side of your face if you are having a relationship with god this is a one-on-one -on -one relationship Face to face, I am connected with God. And because of my relationship with you, may whatever I say, may whatever I think, may whatever I feel, may whatever I meditate on be acceptable, favorable to the front side of your face. If God is the only one that knows the depths of your heart, and if God is the only one that knows what you truly feel and think, he is face to face with you. He's here. He's ever present. You cannot praise God behind his back and lie to him in his face. You can't talk about God behind his back and say, God, God, you're great to, to his face. 
you can't say God, I don't trust you anymore behind his back, but then say God to his face, I, I trust you. See, we do that in church. We, we, we come to church, hands raised, praising God, but all week, you doubting, you're unsure, you don't know where the next meal is going to come from, and you're mad, you're cursing God, you curse your spouse, curse your kids. Sunday rolls around, get yourself dolled up, God, I love you. God, you're worthy. God, I bless your holy name. You get home and you're still mad and you lost all sense of trust. We lie to God. I know you don't mean to, but you lie to God a lot. The moment you say, God, I trust you, and yet you stress about how you're going to fix this and fix that and fix them, you're lying to him. David said the formula is not just the words that I say out of my mouth, but may the meditations of my heart, even though you may not hear me speak negative, I got to be honest to myself and honest to what's happening within. I got to be congruent. I got to be parallel. I got to be on the same page with what comes out of my heart and what's in my mouth. And David said, may it be acceptable to your face. May I be in honesty, in an honest relationship with you to your face, not only with my words of exhortation and praise, but with the meditation of my heart. That is my sermon for today. But I want to close with you all meditating. I know many of you are hurting, many of you are in pain, many of you are struggling. And we have uh, posted on the uh, church's website where you can find all scriptures, scriptures for healing and scriptures for faith for you to meditate upon. I wanna thank my wife for putting this together. She put this, these lists of scriptures together right around the time the coronavirus hit. And she put these scriptures together because she wanted to share these with people who were dealing with this virus and who needed words posted in their hospital rooms, posted in their sick rooms, so that people can hear and read and feel the word of God shadowing over them my wife said and honey forgive me if i'm sharing too much but she said share with me she had a dream that this virus is like an evil spirit hovering over people trying to take folks out it's as if it's like a wet blanket trying to suffocate lives and it's been successful and she put together these scriptures with the hope of people who hear them will find healing and restoration. What I wanna ask is that after every scripture I read, I would like for you to say amen. You say amen because you agree. This is not my words, these are the words of God. I'm gonna read a number of scriptures here, so you're gonna have to be patient with me. You already been here this long. So be patient with me, but these scriptures, they are life. And I'm challenging you to change the words that come out of your mouth. You know the formula, Psalms 1914. Change what comes out of your mouth. Change the words that are echoing in your heart and in your mind. And let everything that you say and think be acceptable to the sight of God. If you agree to these terms, would you say amen? amen. If you're on Zoom, would you say amen? I'm, I'm going to wait till somebody texts me amen. If you're listening on the phone, your phone line is muted, but would you say amen on the phone? Somebody text me amen because I want agreement on this. Amen. Amen. The first set of scriptures I'm going to read are for healing and health. Exodus chapter 23, verse 25. You shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water. And I will take sickness away from among you. Let the people of God say amen. Amen. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 5. I feel the Lord in this place. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. But for you who fear my name, 
the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 14. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me and I shall be saved. For you are my praise. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Matthew chapter 9 verse 28 through 30. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him and Jesus said to them, quote, do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes saying, quote, according to your faith, be it done to you. End quote. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, see that no one knows about this. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Matthew chapter 9, verse 6 through 7. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed and go home. King James Version says, and walk. And he arose and went home. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Matthew chapter 9, verse 20 to 22. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a, dis a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, my daughter. My Lord, take heart, my daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly, praise God, the woman was made well. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Hallelujah. The next set of scriptures we're going to be reading will deal with stress and frustration. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. Come to me, all of you who are laboring and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let the people of God text me now. Amen. Amen. John 14 and 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Let the people of God shout me down. Amen. Amen. Third John chapter one, verse two. Beloved, I pray that you all may go well. I pray that all may go well with you. Let me recite this again. Third John chapter one, verse two. Behold, beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. I'm going to read it one more time. Third John chapter 1 verse 2. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. My God, let the people of God say amen. amen. The next two chap verses are about forgiveness and redemption. James 5 and 16, chapter 5 verse 16 Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 through 6. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. 
but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let the people of God say amen. amen. This last verse is in reference to the future that is to come. Revelations chapter 21 verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from your eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away let the people of God say amen, amen. we'll close by going where we started Psalms 19 and 14 let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my rock, my redeemer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to meditate. Many of us have been going and going and going and going and going and have not slowed down enough to just think about you. We have allowed negativity to percolate and to resound within the chambers of our heart, echoing throughout our body. And we have allowed these things to harm us and to hurt us. Father, we have for so long self-sabotaged ourselves. We've self-sabotaged our futures and the prospects of what could be. And yet we came to you time after time after time praying and asking you to perform a miracle when we've sabotaged those miracles with our words. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every believer listening to the sound of my voice. Father, I'm praying that you teach every one of them how to meditate and how to think and how to process and how to echo words of positivity and words that reflect what you actually think of us. Father, in this season of quarantine, in this season of resetting, in this season of rejuvenation, in this season of starting all over again, Father, we all need this season. Would you bless us to learn how to use it wisely? Bless this time, Father, to teach us how to meditate wisely how to think wisely, how to feel wisely, how to cut off negatively wisely, how to prepare for the future wisely, how to prepare and deal with the right now wisely, and how to think about and reflect on the past wisely. Father, we pray for every soul listening to the sound of my voice that you give us the strength to move forward. For some of us, it's going to be immediate. Father, for some of us, it's going to take a while. But while we go through our process, Father, let the words of David be our story. Let it be our testimony. Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to your face. We want it to be right. We want to be congruent. We want to be in alignment behind your back to your face. Wherever we go, Father, bless us to be congruent. Bless, bless us to be in alignment. 
because you are our Lord, you are our strength, and you are our Redeemer. Keep us, Father, while we're separated from each other, but keep us because we're not separated from you. Be with those of us who are dealing with sick loved ones, those of us who may be sick ourselves. Heal our bodies. Bless us to speak words of healing over our loved ones and ourselves. Bless us as we go to and fro to the store, to the job, there and everywhere, Father. Bless us to be protected by your mighty hand. Bless us to move in faith, not in fear, in faith. Bless us to move in faith with wisdom, not in ignorance, but faith and wisdom, Father. Father, we speak blessings over every soul, over the, those who are in the room, those listening, those watching. We speak blessings. We speak peace. We speak healing. And we do this in the name that is above every name, that's greater than all circumstances. We speak this and pray this in the name of Jesus. Let the people and the believers in God say amen. Amen and amen. We love you. And we are praying for you. This is now our time where we give to the Lord. In many churches, we follow this, this pattern of giving called tithing. And tithing, according to scripture, is the believer giving a tenth of what they have earned to the Lord. The reason why God requires a tenth is because it is the minimal investment that you can make to tell God thank you. While some struggle with giving a tenth of their earnings to the Lord, many forget that the tenth is only one tenth of the entire gift that God has given us. God, he allows us to manage and deal with the 90%, but he's saying, give me a tenth as a sign of trust and as a sign of faith. The Bible says that when you give to the Lord and you give your tithe, he says that he will open up a window of blessing and he will pour out blessings that you won't even have room to receive. As you prepare to give to the Lord today, as you prepare to give to this church, to this ministry, the Bible also calls us to be cheerful givers. The Bible calls us to give with a willingness of heart. If you are frustrated and you're stressing out and you don't want to give and you don't know where your heart is right now, don't give because it won't be blessed. But if you are going to give, give because you want to. Give because your heart says, God, I'm willing. I want to. I must so that I can give back, Father, what you've given to me. I'm going to ask that you give online. You can give through Cash App or through Tithely, our online application where it takes payment however you choose to give it. If you want to know where you can find our giving pages, you can go to livingfaithct.org forward slash give. Again, that is livingfaithct.org forward slash give. You'll see two links there where you can give through Cash App or through Tithely. And if you prefer to mail your check-in, you can mail it in to Living Faith Church, care of Dr. William Clark. Again, that's Living Faith Church, care of Dr. William Clark. The address is 75 Charter Oak Avenue, 75 Charter Oak Avenue, Suite 1-301, Suite 1-301. We are located in the city of Hartford, state of Connecticut. Again, the city of Hartford, the state of Connecticut, and our zip code is 06106. That is 06106. As you are giving, I want to thank all of you who have been giving to this ministry, especially since this coronavirus hit. Many of you who would normally give in person have now shifted to giving online. Many of you have shifted to giving and mailing your offerings in. From my wife and I, we say thank you. Because of your gifts, we are able to do amazing things. Because of your gifts, this church will be a part of giving away 2,500 masks to families, low-income families who do not have masks. I have been fortunate enough to have a mother, a caring mother and father from Philadelphia 
who shipped uh, to me and my wife and my family some homemade masks. My mother has been a blessing to me because of these masks. But I also know as I put on this mask and the mask that she's made for me every day, I know that this mask reminds me how blessed I am. The mask that you guys are wearing in this room, the mask you may be wearing on your job, driving, going to the store right now, the mask you're gonna be putting on, whether it's a reusable mask or a disposable mask, your mask is a symbol of how blessed you are. Pastor, what does that mean? There are so many families who have to choose between paying bills and getting a mask made. There are families who are struggling to figure out, well, I don't know how to make a mask and I'm wearing a scarf. It's hot outside. You can't wear a scarf in the springtime and the summertime. This virus is not gonna go away anytime soon and many families are in need of masks because of your giving because of your commitment to this ministry, this church in partnership with other partners are gathering 2,500 masks. And I thank you for your giving. If you wonder how your giving is making an impact, it is. Last Christmas, your giving allowed us to have an awesome Christmas dinner for our seniors and give away Christmas toys for our seniors and eighth, sixth grade kids at Milner School. Your giving is allowing us to purchase masks so that families around the state of Connecticut, and yes, I said it, around the state of Connecticut, can have masks. This church, while we are located in Hartford, we minister to this entire state. And on behalf of my wife and I, I wanna tell you, thank you. Thank you for your giving in the past. Thank you for your giving that you're giving right now. For those of you who are putting it in an envelope and licking it and mailing it off, thank you. For those who are hitting the send button, thank you. For those who were cash app in the church, thank you. For those who were going to give in the room, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And in the words of my late grandfather, he used to say all the time when he used to raise a church offering, you just can't beat God giving. The more you give to him, the more he gives to you. That's an old church song. And if y'all been to church, uh, been in church a long time, y'all would know how that goes. It's an old song, but you just can't beat God giving. I am a living witness. And to my wife, thank you, honey, for sending our tithing offering in as well. And as you're wrapping up, uh, we thank you. I will send out a message sometime this week. If you wish to give above and beyond your typical gift so that we can get more masks, if we can get another 2,500 masks and give away 5,000, I'm working on that as we speak. If you want to give towards that, you'll get a message from me on how you can do that. But in terms of today, thank you for your tithe and your offering. And for those who want to give in the room, um, you can give in the room. You can leave your gift probably at the, at the table behind you. So with that being said, we love you. We have Bible study this week. If you missed it two weeks ago, I was talking about food and drinks and smelling good and looking good. I don't know what I'm going to talk about this Wednesday. All I'm going to tell you is you don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss it. Amen. Before I go, um, just any prayer requests, and, I, and I'm just going to focus on the folks who are on uh, Zoom who can text it in. Any prayer requests, please take a moment and text it in right now. Any prayer requests in the room that, I, that we can pray for before we dismiss for today? Your mom. We're going to pray for Lisa's mom, Miss Georgie. I had a chance to speak with her. Good to hear her voice. We're going to be praying for her. Any other prayer requests in the room? Art Jr. We're going to lift up Art Jr. <laughs> Art Jr. Art Jr. He's the third. We're going to lift up Art Jr. Any prayer requests on Zoom? Uh, my wife says, please pray for the Ulysses family. Um, that's my wife's former pastor. His father passed away uh, due to this wretched virus. We're going to pray for the Ulysses family. Uh, Stephanie says she wants prayer for co-workers who have tested positive. Stephanie, if you don't know, is a nurse. She is on the front line. She is exposed to this wretched virus, and some of her co-workers have, uh, have contracted this virus as a result. You don't know how hard these people are working long hours in a hazardous environment. Our firefighters, our police officers, our mayors, our town officials, our nurses, our doctors, they're working hard. One particular CEO said on the news that many of his doctors and nurses, they go home and sleep in their cars. They don't go inside the house because they don't want to infect the family. Many of them have gotten hotel rooms separated from their families for almost a month and a half now. 
And if you love your family like I love mine, being away from your family, ain't nothing cool about that. So Stephanie, we will be praying for them. Any other prayer requests, I'll give you another minute to text it in and into the, the chat here for Zoom. Any other prayer requests? Amen. My wife said, <clears throat> this is a good one. Please pray for the cashiers and the security guards at stores. If you've been to Target, if you've been to Walmart, <laughs> been to Home Depot, whatever's open, they now have clear guards up. It is strange. It's weird. You would only see that, and I'm from Philadelphia, so I don't know what y'all do in Hartford, but you only see those clear glass uh, containers, honey, in Philly. Uh, when you go to the hood and you go to the store and you got to hand your money in through the glass guards, that's a normal thing in Philly pre-corona, right? It's so strange to live in a place like Connecticut and see these plastic guards up where people are just, you got to hand things through. You go to McDonald's, they got to hand it under the guard. It's strange. But please pray for the cashiers. We praise God that they're working. Many of them need those jobs. We thank God for that. But we pray for their safety of dealing with the public. People are coming to the store half naked, undressed, not washing their hands. I walked into Target the other day and saw a little girl playing in the Target. I have a lot of thoughts about that. But even in this season where germs are floating, people are just not being fully careful. My wife says, please pray for the children and youth who are experiencing depression and missing graduation activities and peer activities. My cousin Robert has graduated from high school virtually. There are people graduating from college uh, virtually. They are missing, I, 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 they're missing graduation. And for me, I, I, uh, I missed, I went to my undergrad graduation. I didn't go to my graduate graduation, but the most memorable graduation was my doctoral graduation. And for my Regent family, and for those doctors who are graduating, especially Regent, because it is a blessed, blessed ceremony that they have, a two-day event. To miss it, not because you can't afford it, but to miss it because of this virus, they are missing a blessed event. And my heart goes out to those people who are uh, who hitting that milestone and just can't enjoy it. Any other prayer requests that you have, just a few more moments, text them in here. And as you're texting, we're going to start praying. Father, we thank you so much for what you've done and we thank you for the gifts that have been given and we pray father that you bless us to be great stewards over them bless us to multiply those gifts we pray father that you return at 30 60 100 fold and father we lift up our prayer request today because we know father you are great and greatly to be praised we pray father for our senior who is recovering in the hospital we thank you for the progress he's making we thank you for the progress he's making. We thank you for the doctors and nurses who are ministering to him as we speak. We pray, Father, for Miss Georgie as she has been a caretaker of Art and her family for so many years. Father, would you keep her, heal her, protect her. We pray for Art Jr., Father. You know what he's dealing with. You know what he's navigating, Father. Would you visit his heart, visit his mind, visit him wherever he is, and fill him with your love. Father, we pray for the Ulysses family who lost their patriarch last week, this past week. We pray for Pastor, Fran, uh, Pastor uh, Ulysses and his family. We pray for Jeff Day, our, our dear friend, and his mom and his, his family, Father. We pray for those who are just feeling pain right now. Father, we pray for coworkers of Stephanie who have tested positive for this virus Father, we pray that you heal their bodies, but also, Father, we pray for their finances. We pray, Father, that their job continues to pay them and then some. We pray that they have a job to come back to. We pray for their health care coverage. We pray, Father, that they don't miss a beat financially while they are recovering. We pray for Stephanie, Father, that as she works in this environment, she drives people home, she takes care of her clients. Keep her, keep her children keep her children. Father, we pray for the cashiers, the security guards, the people who serve our food. We pray for the restaurant workers who are still making food, who are still serving the public. We pray for even the Best Buy workers. Father, we went to Best Buy yesterday to pick up an order. We pray for those people who are working. We th we're thankful that they have jobs and we're thankful that they're still serving us in some capacity. But would you keep those workers, Father? It ain't easy. 
It's not easy. But you bless, Father, those who are struggling right now, the children who are home, who can't go back to school, who have to stay in a negative, nasty, malnourished, ungodly environment. For those kids who saw school as a reprieve, as a, as a protection, as a strong tower. But you keep those kids, Father. But you bless those who are dealing with depression, anxiety. Those who are struggling with being boxed in. But you bless those who are in prison. Some who are just about to get out and can't get out because they, they're sick and they're stuck. And those who are in the halfway houses, Father, would you see about them too? Bless the young people and those who went to school, those who went back to school and who were about to graduate. And now they had to cancel those, uh, those events. Father, there's so much need. But Father, we trust you with our needs. We trust you with our hearts. We trust your Father with our minds. We trust you, Father, with everything that we have. And we pray this prayer because we know you can do anything above and beyond what we ask for and what we think. We pray this prayer in the matchless name of Jesus. Let the people of God say, let the people of God text me now. Amen. 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 And amen. We love you. We love you. We love you. We'll see you all next Sunday. God bless you.